our next speaker is um, Syl Pernick, um, and she's going to talk about a synthetic multi-step autoregulated differentiation pathway from embryonic stem cells to insulin-producing beta-like cells. So I put as many buzzwords in this title as I could to try and draw people into the auditorium today. Uh, I'm not quite sure that it worked the way I wanted it to. So what I'm going to be speaking on is uh, the beta cell system and um, how we um, are differentiating uh, stem cells into beta-like cells. But I also want to speak um, in, uh, um, uh, in a wider scale uh, about mammalian cells and synthetic biology and how we are creating systems in, a, uh, in specific a tissue homeostasis system um, in Ron Weiss's lab. And so, of course, we all want to do systems-level bioengineering in synthetic biology, which means that we want to program cell populations to perform various levels, uh, various tasks very reliably, robustly. And you can imagine that this includes a lot of different, um, a lot of different things that we want the cells to do. And in our lab, we started out uh, working with um, bacteria, and we uh, continue to work with bacteria, but we also now work with yeast and mammalian cells. And you can imagine that mammalian cells are going to be uh, quite complex, and they are. Um, so in the, in, in the past and now, um, the first wave of synthetic biology uh, really includes now and in the past, where people are, are, are creating uh, devices, parts, and modules that work in cells and that are characterizable. Um, but what we're looking forward to and what the goal is for synthetic biologists really is, this, is what we call the second wave of synthetic biology, where we take these parts, devices, and modules and we, we place them together and we make them work together um, in full systems. So the goal really is to design these sophisticated biological systems in a reliable, efficient, and predictable manner. And of course, we use standard engineering techniques. But one of the things that we have to remember is that we're working with biology. And so what almost all of us in this room has probably found is that biology thwarts us at every turn. And so we have to realize that there are things that we need to take into account, such as crosstalk, cell, cell death, mutations, noise, and in specific uh, cellular context. So what I mean by that is if you take a module and <clears throat> you characterize it in, in a, any given cell, and you know how it works, you know what the input and the output is going to be, and then you take a second module and you do the same thing with it, and you want to place these modules together in the same cell, you're not quite sure what that output is going to be. It's not predictable what that output is going to be, especially in mammalian cells. And in particular, um, for mammalian cells and probably for other, other types of cells as well, even if these modules and these uh, combinatorial modules are, are uh, characterized within a given cell, if you place it within another cell, the output is going to be different and still not very predictable. So we need to think about that very hard, and we need to think about why that's happening and how we can make this discipline a little bit more predictive. So, um, it, so now we have a, a, a good um, library of parts and modules, and in, in, in a lot of ways, uh, looking at these parts and modules are, are, uh, and thinking about how they're going to work in the cells are quite intuitive. But once we get to the systems level, bioengineering, bioengineering <clears throat> level, um, we really need new types of compu computational tools because these things are not that intuitive. So what we decided to do was we decided to take synthetic biology and place it into stem cells. And um, the reason why we decided to do this is because stem cells are quite flexible in what we can get them to do. And we were very interested in tissue engineering. And so the question is, can we create these um, large-scale predefined tissue patterns out of stem cells, and how do we go about doing that? And so we have many different ways of approaching this by using initial cell placement, by engineering some types of cell-cell communication, 
um, by using information processing, and then by taking all of that and interfacing it to differentiation within the, the stem cells. And so I just want to quickly mention that we have dabbled in, um, in uh, creating small modules such as uh, AHL-based communication, and we've gotten this to work uh, to a certain degree. And so we have an optimized mammalian sender, which is functional, and we have an optimized uh, mammalian receiver, which turns green upon uh, addition of AHL, which you can see here. And in addition, we have uh, a functional toggle switch in mammalian cells, too, where the two inputs are ATC and IPTG. And um, in this case, when IPTG is added, there's no fluorescence. Upon a transient addition of ATC, you get um, an increase in fluorescence until you add IPTG again transiently, and the uh, fluorescence disappears. So keep that in mind, because when I come back to the systems, you're going to see how eventually this is going to fit in. So uh, when I arrived in the lab, I wanted to work with stem cells. And so I want to step back a little bit, because we've heard very few talks in, in this uh, conference about mammalian cells in particular and stem cells in, in specific. And so this is a picture of what stem cells are. And um, in, in particular, human embryonic stem cells. I work with mouse at the moment, although we're going to move into human fairly soon. And what it is is uh, at about five days post-fertilization, you have something called a blastocyst. And within the blastocyst, you have a group of cells, about 300 cells in, in that little mass. It's called an inner cell mass. All of those 300 cells, if you take them out of the blastocyst, are human embryonic or mouse embryonic stem cells. And what this means is that they have the potential to turn into any cell in the body, any cell in the body. So what does this mean? Well, this is a very simplistic diagram of what embryonic stem cells can do, because not only can they turn into these three germ layers, but they can turn into uh, another germ layer called trophectoderm, which, which um, uh, eventually forms the placenta. But the, the germ layers are the, the, um, the cells that the stem cells turn into first before turning into the different tissues in our body. And the reason why I say this is a little bit simplistic is because all of the tissues in our body are actually created with a combination of these germ layer cells anyway. But um, if we look at an, a, another simplistic, what we think of as a simplistic system, and this is a, a system called, uh, from the sea urchin, um, and it's the development of the sea urchin into mesoderm and, and endoderm tissue. Um, we can see that even though this is supposed to be a simplistic system, it's actually quite complex. And I think that as we move into systems, we really need to uh, pay attention to the biology and to the systems biology and to the biology in general. Um, because when we want to take things like stem cells, or other types of cells and turn them into tissues, we need to understand what this means and what sulfate regulators to use that we need to drive any, any given differentiation process and form any given tissue that we decide to form. So within our lab, we've, we've tried to direct differentiation using um, by placing sulfate regulators under the uh, control of the TRE promoter. And so in the presence of doxycycline, we've been able to form all of these tissues. And I'll show you a little bit, a little movie. This is the first movie that I made <clears throat> when I got into the lab, if it will go. Let's see. I'm not sure it's going to go. Yeah, I see it on my screen, but I don't see it up here. So what you should be seeing is you should be seeing uh, stem cells turn into muscle cells. But in lieu of that, I actually have some still pictures of that happening. And so we've been able to maintain stem cells. We've been able to turn them into muscle fibers. And this is typically after only four days of differentiation in culture. These are neurons. These are fat cells. 
These are endoderm, and this is trophectoderm, which turns into placenta. <clears throat> and this seems to be fairly easy to do, with, uh, at least with the mouse stem cells. And so we decided to look into a full system. And one of the systems that is uh, very highly um, characterized is the development of pancreatic beta cells. And the beta cells are the cells that produce insulin. Um, and so you can imagine that in diabetes, in type 1 diabetes, it's an autoimmune disease. And in this autoimmune disease, the cells of uh, the immune system of, of your body attacks the beta cells, killing them off, <clears throat> and thus relieving you of any insulin that you have. So our I idea and our ultimate goal was to maintain population levels of beta cells using um, some sort of autoregulation some sort of autoregulated differentiation of ES cells so that we could maintain that population of beta cells. <clears throat> and so we looked at what we, what we wanted the cells to do at a very schematic level, and what we, what we said we wanted them to do was uh, have the ES cell population look at itself. If it was too high, then it would tell itself to stop growing, to put itself into growth arrest, and I'll come back to that. But if it was low, it would say continue to proliferate, and this is cell density. Um, so if it was going into growth arrest, then it would make a call to um, another uh, cell density, cell-cell communication system, and ask if the beta cell population was either low or high. And if it was high, then maintain growth arrest. If it was low, uh, let's let's have some beta cell differentiation. And this ended up with um, what you'll see as a complex system with over 25 components that we're going to eventually have to put into each cell. And our, and our goal is not to have fluctuation because you don't want the patient to have fluctuations in their insulin levels. Our goal really is to have a very uh, steady um, population of stem cells and a very steady population of beta cells, stem cells that are waiting in the wings to turn into beta cells as these beta cells disappear. So what's interesting is that this grew out of an iGEM project two years ago, and since then it's become um, one of the major projects in, in the Weiss lab. Um, and the motivation behind us doing this, of course, is to improve our understanding biologically of the required or sufficient factors for beta cell differentiation. But also, <clears throat> we wanted to explore um, a greater mechanism for tissue homeostasis. And we wanted to, to make it such that this could be used for other cell types or for multiple disease states, and perhaps be a basis for clinical application, and perhaps to help develop methodology and tools for systems level bioengineering. <coughs> And so what we decided to do is we decided to do a multi-step um, uh, method whereby we not only give this, the go signal to the cells, but we also allow the cells to make a call to the endogenous differentiation pathways. And so it becomes a self-timed pathway to differentiation, to, to final differentiated state. And so um, the, first, the first step uh, is to, um, to give the go signal and allow the, uh, the cell fate regulator that turns the cell into endoderm to, to be expressed. And these cell fate regulators, the cell fate regulators that we chose to use are GATA4, SOX17, and GATA6. And these are known cell fate regulators to turn stem cells into endoderm, which is one of the um, germ layers. Um, and as you can see, these are uh, embryonic stem cells that um, are unadulterated, that um, are, are, have not differentiated at all. And uh, after a four-day period of differentiation, this is what they turn into a very co nicely cobblestoned um, pattern. After about nine days, you can see the cells starting to turn red and, and uh, forming these very nice round colonies. And uh, the morphology of the cells change as well. They become very small. So what's happening here is that once these cells turned into endoderm, they started producing something called alpha fetoprotein. And alpha fetoprotein um, activated our engineered uh, alpha fetoprotein promoter, where um, we've placed uh, uh, two um, 
sulfate regulators that will turn these cells into uh, beta-like cells, NGN3 and PDX1, that will turn this on. And so these cells are now producing NGN3 and PDX1 and are also turning red. So the question is, are these cells producing insulin? And we looked at this in two different ways and are looking at this in several other ways right now. And the first way we looked at it was by doing some qPCR. And so we're looking at the mRNA levels here. And the interesting thing here is that, is that um, after 20 days, uh, the combination of GATA6 and NGN3 really caused a, a great increase in the levels of mRNA and insulin, whereas the other, other combinations did not. So, but what we really want to see is we really want to see processed insulin. And um, insulin is made as a pre-pro-insulin, and then the signal peptide is cleaved off to uh, create pro-insulin. This, and then this portion is cleaved, um, and this portion is called the C-peptide to form insulin plus the C-peptide. And there are some very nice antibodies out there that are very specific for this C-peptide. And so we looked at uh, whether we're seeing processed insulin by looking at the antibodies against the C-peptide, and we see that uh, the GATA factor plus NGN3 shows some very nice production of insulin along with PDX1 and both together. So now we know we can produce insulin. We can engineer insulin production from stem cells. So how do uh, we regulate differentiation um, in these cells? And so we created um, a, a logic gate where, whereby we wanted to look at um, stem cell population. And if stem cell population is high, and if beta cell population is low, then they will differentiate. Otherwise, <clears throat> the stem cells will continue to self-renew. And so this is the high-level um, abstraction of that, and uh, we uh, partition that into three different modules, a population control module, a differentiation module, and a safety module where the cells would die if they were outside of the environment of the pancreas. And so this is what um, this looks like at a very high level. And um, if you look at the pathways that we developed, this is what this looks like. Here's the population control module, which is um, basically a quorum sensing module. This is a, a, another population control module for beta cells plus differentiation. And this is the safety module. But the problem with this is that when we modeled it, we found that this step was much too slow. <clears throat> And now I can jump on the bandwagon and say this is a graph of the U.S. stock market now, and this is a graph of what it'll be in a few months. So, so I'm hopeful. Um, but what happened here is when we modeled this is that the stem cells depleted over time, and at the same time endoderm increased, and the cells piled up as endoderm. And so what ended up happening is that this entire circuit was, was short-circuited, basically. So we had to revise our logic, and we had to basically uncouple the differentiation from the commitment stage. And so now here we say that um, if the, the uncommitted population is high and the committed population is low, then we send it to a toggle switch. And this toggle switch will help make the decision whether to, whether to go into commitment and differentiation or no commitment and self-renewal. But we still had the problem of the cells piling up. We still had this symmetry problem with the cells. And so we decided to add an oscillator into the AND gate. And whenever this oscillator is at a high level, this would then be true. And what this, oops, what this did was this ended up decoupling the commitment from the differentiation and it ended up, and the oscillator helped break the symmetry. So this is what this looks like at a high level. So now you notice that there are four modules and not three. And I'm not going to go over this because I don't have time, but what, what it is is very complicated. And so this is the model where we have over 25 um, components that need to be put into each stem cell. Um, but basically what you see here is that you have a population control module, a symmetry breaking plus commitment module, a differentiation module, and a safety module. And this is where the decision-making process occurs. And Recall that I said that, that we have a working toggle, and here's the toggle. 
we have a working, we have some, some sort of cell-cell communication working, and we have two areas where we need that in this, in this model. And um, we have a grad student working on this oscillator and cascade system, and of course the differentiation works. So we have pieces of this working quite well, and the trick obviously is going to be uh, getting them to work together in the same cell. And this is just a simulation to show that adding that oscillator really does work because the oscillator over time becomes asynchronous. And so instead of trying to create an oscillator that's synchronous like many synthetic biologists are doing, we like to use the asynchrony of the oscillator. And it allows cells to trickle down into the commitment stage. And so what ends up happening is that we have cells that are always ready to differentiate at any given time. And so this is a, our first simulation of this model. And it's not a very good simulation because you don't want the patient to oscillate up and down. The blue is an uncommitted cell. The red is a committed cell. And what you want is a steady state of both cells. And so we had to optimize the system because there was hysteresis in the system. And so we used sensitivity analysis and negative feedback and genetic algorithms to optimize our parameter set. And so this is what we ended up with, a much better model, a much better simulation. So in this system, we learned that uh, we can use parts and modules that are adaptable and interchangeable, and that um, this field allows us to create these programs that, that can control stem cell behavior if you put a bit of work into it, and that we can control these things temporally by making calls to the endogenous pathways and spatially by using cell-cell communication. Um, what's interesting about this, uh, this tissue homeostasis system is that the differentiation module is separate from the commitment module. And that means that if the population control and the commitment module work, you can basically swap out any type of differentiation that you want. So for example, if you have uh, neurodegeneration, uh, neurodegenerative disease, and you want to continually regulate the amount of neurons of any given type of neuron, you can pop that in if you know how to differentiate the cells into the type of neurons that you want. So it becomes um, a, 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 a application that's very broad-based that will work with many different disease states, we hope, and many different cell types. And so I'd like to thank especially Ron Weiss for allowing me to work in his lab for the past few years on this project. And uh, Noah, who is a grad student who's working on um, a lot of the commitment module. Uh, Miles, who did a lot of the uh, modeling. Cyram, who did a lot of the foundational work in the toggle switch. And Ehor and Christoph, who uh, helped a lot with, the, with stem cells and are still helping with stem cells and NSF and Johnson & Johnson for funding this research and for, um, for the people here who, uh, who invited me to give this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? Yes. We don't know yet. <laughs> We're not at that stage yet. Is that something that's going to be an issue, or, or is it okay for these certain aspects of this to be noisy? I, it, I would say that probably it's going to be, uh, to a certain extent, it's going to be okay, and, and that maybe we can even use that noise to our advantage. But we're not quite sure exactly what's going to happen when we put everything together at this point. <clears throat> Questions? Which stem cells are you going to use or are you using of the two possibilities? One is just uh, natural st the stem cells as got from embryo or another which is reverted from already differentiated and reverted back to the... Right, the IPS cells is what you're referring to. Uh, we're going to start with the embryonic stem cells. The IPS cells are still not completely characterized. Those are induced pluripotent cells. And those are cells which you start with uh, uh, a differentiated cell and you revert back to a stem cell-like state. 
Um, and I say stem cell-like state because really they have not been characterized completely and we're, we're not quite sure how far you can take those cells. Yes. Yes. viruses, but we're looking for other alternative methods that may be better. Uh, lentivirus, lentiviral delivery um, is not random. And, and by that I mean uh, it will randomly integrate into some pretty bad sites into the cell on occasion. So there are hot spots where it will integrate. Uh, well, we're looking into, um, well, Actually, we're just looking right now, but there are some episomal methods that are possible. There's um, um, other viruses that are that are possible as well. Adenovirus, possibly. Yeah. Where do we get our parameters from? We're, we do. Um, so I didn't personally do the modeling. And so the initial parameters, uh, we, a lot of this is from the quorum sensing that we've done in, in lab. But then we, we optimize by using global sensitivity analysis. And we get sets of parameters that eventually we'll, we'll probably look at and, and use and see what, you know, what things we need to change in, in the system in order to get these modules to work well together. Okay, I think we'll move on. Thank you very much. Okay.